imagine that you're with me in Sierra Leone in the middle of the epidemic. And you have the bad luck to develop fevers and chills. So you're going to be admitted to an Ebola treatment unit. But you know, you could have malaria, you could have cholera, you could have yellow fever. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to test your blood. If you're positive, we'll move you to a confirmed ward. If you're negative, you can take a shower and you can go home. So you're OK until you realize that even if you don't have Ebola, one of your friends in the suspect ward might. If you weren't exposed to Ebola before, you will be now. Because in reality, Ebola treatment units don't look like the sanitized graph I just showed you. They look like this. This is my Ebola treatment unit from August 2014. I'm the short one in the middle. That's usually the case. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're not going to get your blood results for another three days, because there are only two laboratories in the entire country that run this test. Now fast forward to November 2014, a few months later. Billions of dollars in aid in the field. Many agencies are in the field. And yet, you're still not going to get your blood drawn for a few days. What's going on? So since it's a real story, I can tell you how the rest of this ends. There's a national lab working group that's formed, and they investigate this. And they find out that all the blood that's drawn in this epicenter of the Ebola outbreak is drawn by two guys uh, hired by the government. And these two phlebotomists go everywhere together because they only have one bike between them. And by the way, people forgot to put gas money on the budget line, which means that they pay out of pocket. And when they don't have cash, they can't travel. Billions of dollars later, many agencies on the floor, and we're still propagating the epidemic, sending people out who are now exposed to the Ebola epidemic that weren't before. So what could have been done? We could have had better coordination during the outbreak. We could have had better healthcare systems to begin with. We could have had better surveillance for infectious diseases. How about something that underlies all of that? Good governance at the national level. The idea of global health security is that fact that we're all connected, because infectious diseases can cross borders and affect all of us. They can be emerging pathogens like Ebola, SARS, MERS, Zika. They can be infections that can be weaponized, like anthrax. They can be infections that are so pervasive that they can destabilize political, economic, and social infrastructures, like HIV. In the aftermath, so the international health regulations actually suggest that all countries should do everything in their power to prevent and respond to infectious diseases. And should those threats arise, they should report it to everybody else. In the aftermath of the Ebola outbreak, there's a lot of excitement about global health security as a new platform for collaboration. Centers for Disease Control and USAID have formed their own global health security agenda. Plans of action include creating laboratory capacity, training healthcare workers, strengthening the public health system. But nowhere on that, on that agenda is governance or the impact of poor governance and specifically corruption on the response to outbreaks. In fact, none of the many reports that came out in the aftermath of the Ebola outbreak actually deal with that. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of blame to go around. International agencies, WHO, media. But outbreaks, uh, a corruption during outbreaks are particularly pernicious, and I'll, I'll show you how. Transparency International ranks Guinea as 150 out of 177 on their corruption rank. The higher you are, the worse it is. Sierra Leone, 117. Liberia, 83. So this is how corruption can hurt. First, it can take away resources directly from the outbreak response. In Sierra Leone, about one third of the money that made it to the ground for Ebola is unaccounted for. Turns out those missing bikes, only the tip of the iceberg. Money, uh, monies that are set aside from outreach uh, programs and for sensitization programs disappeared unidentified uh, members of individuals that the payments were made out to instead of organizations. Procurement uh, routes were not followed. Salaries to healthcare workers not, were not paid out as they should have been. So there were healthcare worker strikes and no care for Ebola patients. The other way that the outbreak, the corruption can impact outbreak response is actually by directly propagating the disease. Petty corruption contributed to uh, hampering containment efforts like roadblocks, quarantines, body retrievals, 
burials. Liberia put West Point, one of its most populous communities, under quarantine after a rash of cases arose there. But it was very easy to get up. All you had to do is bribe the military or the police officer who was standing outside. Families could actually bribe uh, burial workers who create certificates that said that their loved one didn't die of Ebola and hence could be released for a traditional burial. WHO in 2014 said that 60% of new cases in Guinea and 80% of new cases in Sierra Leone of Ebola were from unsafe burials. Third way that it can do that, it can affect legitimacy. Julian Kohler, uh, who is the director for a WHO collaborative on governance, transparency, and accountability, suggests that there are three ways that corruption can impact public health sector. First is financial. The second is the health impact. But third, it can impact state uh, image and health pu hence public trust. Now, during outbreaks, governments by necessity have to take on draconian measures. So lack of legitimacy really hurts those containment efforts. So what can be done? This is a chicken doing triage for Ebola. Not a good strategy. <laughs> the first, as Dr. Kohler suggests, is to create better, uh, better funded aid administration. Uh, specific tools for financial accountability. I'll take it one step further. What we need is actually mechanisms to lodge complaints real time and to do investigations. Because as, you, as I just uh, mentioned to you, corruption can in real time propagate disease. Two, when we talk about corruption, often the answer that is given is build a stronger civil society. When it comes to emerging pathogens, one way uh, we can do that is actually building independent academic institutions. Nigeria actually ranks very high on the corruption scale, and yet they were able to handle their Ebola epidemic. Partly that's because they had a very good structure that was left behind from the polio vaccine campaign, but partly because they have independent universities that can do research in public health uh, issues. They also can serve as swing resources during outbreaks, providing things like di diagnostics. Three, we as an international community need to focus on a consistent investment in uh, human resources for health. One of the things that affected this outbreak was petty corruption among healthcare workers. Even before the outbreaks, 48% of Sierra Leoneans and 40% of Liberians reported having to pay for healthcare, supposedly free public sector. And that's because a lot of the healthcare workers are paid pittance. So that can help. So as Camus says, for as long as we can remember, um, Plagues and wars are inevitable, and yet they both take people by surprise every time. Plagues require institutionalized response. So we need to, to keep infectious diseases from becoming epidemics, invest in systems not only during outbreaks, but also the peacetime. And I would say that until we handle governance and corruption, we're fighting that war with one hand tied behind our back. Thank you. <laughs>